coverage of the livestock procurement meeting at the 1983 National NFO Convention, including slaughter cattle, feeder cattle, and hogs. The portion that we're going to talk about this afternoon is to go through what the Livestock Division has done in the last two years. And that's about as far back as I'm going to direct it because I've worked for Livestock since February 1982, so it's coming up on two years for myself since I came back with the organization. I've had the opportunity in the last couple of years to work in a lot of parts of the country with leaders, with members, with committeemen, and working with the divisions in the home office in the last couple of years, we find that there is a common misunderstanding, or in most cases a general lack of knowledge, of what National Farmers Organization is all about. My name is Dan Graff, and I've spent some time earlier working for the Dairy Department in the state of Michigan. I had an opportunity to work for the field staff department out of the home office. And it was at that time that I really found in those two interims how important the county structure is and the need to have people out there working with us as a team for the support of collective bargaining. The procurement department has spent the last two years for the most part, directing ourselves to a group of people that don't have any general understanding of how our programs work and what collective bargaining is designed to do. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that we talk to may know where the collection facilities are. They may even know what day the point runs. But for the most part, the best understanding that they have of the NFO in their mind is it just another buying station? I thought everyone knew what collective bargaining and national farmers were all about. But we find that not to be the case. So I guess we're starting over with a whole new group of people and educating and bringing them to date, just as a lot of you here as members and delegates were brought up in the organization. We've worked with the assistance of the counties and ask them to be supportive on this team effort to provide us with a list of names of people that we could address where we do have facilities to service the membership and the producers. We've worked with the committees, we've worked with the elected officers and asked them to categorize people, producers in that area, into three basic groups into non-members, to non-participating members, and lastly, the membership. Because that's the order that we've addressed in contacting and going down the road. We've talked to the non-member that for the most part has never been involved and has no understanding of the programs. The non-participating member, for one reason or another, that's fallen by the wayside because of a problem or an unanswered question, whatever the case may be, and the membership, you as members and producers, we use as a reference. Because we're always asked, who have you got marketing through the program now? Because I don't want to be the only one. Is there anyone else in it? So we use that as a backing and assurance of our programs. The way that we've set up production drives in cooperation with the counties and with the leadership is we've got a four-step program that we've used within the procurement division and with the assistance of the technicians in making our round. They are the blocking procedure, the negotiation, a ratification or confirmation of approval, <coughs> and the fourth step is delivery. The blocking procedure is once we've got the names accumulated, <coughs> Once we've got them broke down into the categories, we have riders assigned to go with us work down the road. We head to the country and make farm-to-farm -farm contacts and tell the producers what the programs are all about and how they can participate. The second step, the negotiation, is the accumulated total of numbers are negotiated between the home office 
and several packers to offer a bid, so to speak. It's a negotiation between what they will pay as premium and services for the benefit of having that block locked in. The ratification or personal confirmation of the contract is an individual decision by the producers when they come to a ratification meeting called for that purpose only. To question what the negotiation is or what the formulation is and then make a decision whether they're going to put all their livestock or part of their livestock under that pricing structure for one full year. In delivery, I guess we all ought to be proud of that, that this organization is the only one that's got the total nationwide structure, the collection, dispatch, and delivery system to move that production through. I want to give an example, and there's a lot of you guys in here that I've spent some time with, others that I've spent a lot of time with, and working on production drives. We worked in some of your own home counties around your collection points. Some have been extremely successful, some have been marginal, and some we've fallen right on our duff. But I hope we've learned from every one of them. A typical example of the first step here on blocking is we get in the car and go down the road in a 15 to 20 minute presentation address ourselves to a non-member with the assistance of you, one of you as a member and a rider in the car with us to add credibility and strength to what we're saying. Because I can guarantee you, you probably told that neighbor or that friend of yours the same story of how collective bargaining works and what its intentions are. But at that point, I, myself, or the staff person becomes an expert in the field because we're beyond 50 miles from home because it's a new face telling him the same story. And believe it or not, it works. A typical contact would be something of this nature. The writer, the representative from the county there, would introduce me to say, Walt Jones, this is Dan Graff with the Livestock Department. He wants to show you how you and I could both benefit by putting our production through their programs. And that's it. A simple introduction that adds credibility to what we're talking about. At that point, the staff man takes over, and I guess I like to refresh myself and you folks at this point. You've always heard once a close is made or your, your part of the presentation is done, remain quiet, shut up in other words. This is where the staff man takes over. It's really the key part in giving a brief uh, summary of what we have to offer. Tell a producer, we're putting together a block of about 150,000 head of butcher hogs in this area. I myself am working with four other guys in a five county area and asking producers to give us the approximate number of butcher hogs that they would have for the next 12 months to put them on an authorization form and give us 60 days to bargain with them. During that 60 days, our negotiators in Corning are going to take that production to several packers and negotiate on a pricing structure for you for one full year. So what I'm asking of you today is to put down the approximate number of butchers that you intend on marketing the next 12 months, let them become part of that 150,000 head block, and then within 60 days we'll notify you by letter or by phone call or both and invite you to come in to a meeting for the purpose of understanding what the formulations are that we've been able to negotiate. But the guy's got a decision to make because we're asking for a commitment on that part. We're taking a lot of time and a lot of interest on these producers one-on-one -on -one to show them the structure. They need to make a decision that they're going to commit themselves to come to that ratification meeting and participate and listen with open ears to what a group of producers are able to do out of a small area. The authorization form that we use on this four-step procedure, the blocking, the negotiating, ratifying, and delivering. It looks like this, and here's what we ask them to fill out. It simply says that I, name, address, phone number, the city, my zip code, do hereby authorize and direct the National Farmers Livestock Department to negotiate for the sale of the following described livestock 
during the period of November 6, 83 through January 6, 84. Give us 60 days. During the aforementioned period of time, I will be notified of results of negotiation for my approval, and my livestock will be delivered through Stanton Collection Point. If you would raise that up just to here. There is no commitment at this point that guarantees that that production is going to be delivered through the system. It's just that he's agreed to become part of a bargaining block. About two years ago, there was a survey taken, and I suppose you've all heard of this, but I like to use it. It was an independent survey that polled a group of farmers from all over the country, and they said better than 70% felt that they needed a tool, some type of assistance in marketing their production. It said that they spent somewhere between 90 to 95 percent of their time producing, being efficient producers, but less than five, or right at five percent, marketing. So they needed assistance. In going out on these production drives, we sort of challenged those figures. In the bulk of our contacts, in the areas that we've worked, with the support of the membership, we've run anywhere from 80 to 85 percent sign up for authorization to let their production become part of a bargaining block. So the people understand, they agree with the philosophy of collective bargaining. But that's just the first step. That's the first contact. Because once we accumulate those numbers and leave an area, then comes the negotiation portion. We leave this to the bargainers in the home office. They know in most cases what they've got to compete with in order for us to have a competitive pricing structure. Because we need to be competitive as we're reaching our goals to attain that cost of production. We're not asking to take a cut. They know that they must negotiate the freight to be paid by the packer, a premium on the hogs for the luxury and the benefit of having them locked in for one year, and services paid to you, the membership, for this organization doing the weighing, the grading, and writing a trust protected check. It takes volume to go into a packer or a processor. You don't go in with an empty basket and make demands. It takes volume. Then comes the ratification portion. That's where the producers question the, por the formulation and take a real good hard look as to how many hogs they're going to commit and put under contract to be delivered to this organization for the next 12 months. Larry, have you got that contract? The third step is a personal confirmation or ratification where you take those numbers off from that inventory form and when those producers walk in, we hand them back out a copy of it so they can look and convert those numbers with all the pertinent information at the top onto a contract for sale to be delivered through a given specific collection point. All these are just the first step. This four-step approach, when you go to the fourth step now, which is delivery, that's where the real work begins, and that's where the role of the procurement department has taken a responsible position with working with you, the county structure. Probably one of the biggest drawbacks that we've had, and I should probably say shortcomings, has been in areas where we've applied technicians. We've put representatives in the country and called them the experts. We brought trained and qualified people in and seemed to have left out the network that was designed to really work on a county level. The meat committees, the dairy committees, the grain committees, there seemed to be a lack of communication at that point. So the procurement department has addressed ourselves to not only put blocks together to assist the divisions of the livestock department, but to take it a step farther and rebuild that county structure. We began about one year ago now working on a plan to put one man in every county where we conducted production drive that would be there to service and maintain communication with the membership, with those new group of people that we come in contact with. 
an individual that knows basically the outline of what collective bargaining is, the number who operates the point, who the technicians are in the fat cattle, feeder cattle, and the hog division, so that he can stay in contact and when production is ready, we can get a hold of a qualified representative and have him come in. But still, without contact and communication, we go out and put a drive together and we don't have sufficient follow-up service. We don't have a program. And I say, we've had a couple times that we have stumbled, but we've got a lot of successes under our belt, too. We've got a state supervisor that works for this procurement department in the state of Nebraska. We have one in the state of Iowa, in the southeastern corner of the state of Minnesota, and in the state of Wisconsin. The responsibility of these people is that as we go in to a four or five county area, working with you, the membership and leaders in the area, is to recruit an individual that will stay behind there and work for the department, work for the membership, and maintain an ongoing contact with those producers to keep them informed of market trends, point operation, whatever the case may be. You know, we're finding that old habit is hard to break. The habit of marketing hogs of simply calling up or marketing cattle, calling a trucker and saying, hey, I got 10 head, come get them. Wherever the market's the best, take them. If we're out there with enough people to offset that so it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, which has got to come from the counties, we will become the habit of those producers. We will become first and foremost in their mind that when they're ready to market production, they think of National Farmers Organization. But it takes continual contact and communication with those people before you're ever going to put a program together. We took that four-step approach and decided we would modify it, that we would go into areas that already had gone through those procedures. They had put a block together in years past. They had gone and negotiated formulations. <coughs> they've come back and they've had a ratification by the producers, and they've been delivering. We questioned, what could we do if we went out on a one-stop approach with a contract in hand and asked those producers to put production on, on the contract, on the block, to be delivered? Well, I said we ran about 80 to 85 percent on the authorization forms. That's pretty darn good. On the one-time contact going out, we've run anywhere between 20 to 30 percent, so I'm going to say an average of 25 percent of the producers we've talked to have committed and signed production on contract for sale. Probably one of the best success stories that I can talk about just happened here in August of last year. Maybe some of you heard me mention it yesterday when we went up to Browns Valley and Big Stone, Minnesota, right on the South Dakota border. The membership in that area gave us all the names. They provided us the riders, but took those points to where they nearly doubled, and it's maintained that right on through and is still going today. We're not shotgunning this program of implementing those people. We know they need to be trained. We know they need to understand the basic concept of each of the divisions of the Livestock Department. So on a county by county level, as we put new people in around a collection point to service, we've got a training manual put together for them. We've called those people Livestock Solicitors. Maybe proper, maybe not. But we can give them the general information of what they need to know to talk to a producer that has hogs, to talk to a producer that has feeder cattle, and to talk to a producer that has fat cattle to market, of what the information we need is at the home office to represent him properly at the marketplace or to become part of a block when that production is ready. In the state of Nebraska, we've got 13 of these people that are working right now. And I can tell you we've had a little attrition rate in that area. We had 26 at one time. We've cut it in half. We're continuing to train them. We're bringing them in with the support of the Dairy Department and Ted Strait that conducts a PAT program. It's professionally applied techniques in sales. Probably one of the hardest things or obstacles for people to overcome is to realize that when an objection is thrown at you from the country, it's really a question. 
It took me th six weeks, three weeks, whatever, to get my check last time. I didn't like that. What are they really asking? What have you done to improve? What changes have you made in the program? That's all a part of the training, as well as the knowledge that they need to know of each of the division, how to sufficiently market production, that we're given these people. We've got those 13 in Nebraska. We've got seven, six or seven in the state of Iowa. There's five in the state of Minnesota. And I believe Barry Schaller said this morning there's 13 in the state of Wisconsin. Those are the four states that we're working on. We're going to continue to go into South Dakota, spread in Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, Ohio. We want to cover all the areas, and it's going to take time to develop this program. But we are seeing increases and seeing benefit and a new attitude among people in the areas that we've been in. I don't think there's any better way that I can relate to what benefit we've been able to provide for the departments than to let you tell it themselves, or let them tell it to you themselves, how our procurement structure works in line with their commodity department. We've got three of the representatives here with us today, but I want to ask them to give a brief outline of their department and how it works, our procurement division, in line with their division. We've got a fellow here first that's been with us for about three years. He is one of the negotiators out of the home office now. He does a tremendous amount of business with the organization and for you, the membership, in the south and western part of the states. He's John Stewart from the feeder cattle division. If you would, John. Good afternoon. I'm here today on behalf of the feeder cattle department and to discuss some of the functions of the feeder cattle department and also the procurement department and how the two departments work hand in hand. Uh, to do this, I'd like to go back uh, 20, 25 years, and that's a long time before I was even a part of this organization, but to take a look at some of the goals and some of the things that this organization set out to do and how they were going to go about handling this task. Uh, the ideal in the beginning was that a group of people or a team had more power than any one of you out there as an individual. This team concept is not only what we want, need, uh, for our total organization, but is also something we need in each commodity department and uh, possibly a situation between commodity departments and a department uh, like Dan's as procurement. Uh, this situation of working together uh, has to add strength not only to the departments but to the organization. And of course, each of you out there are a very important part. No, I, I want to change that. I want to say each of you out there are the most important part of this team. Because without you and your production, there's no reason for me to be here or any of the rest of us. I might go on to say, uh, because I don't want to take away from some other people when I say you, the producer, are the most important, there are sure some other people out there in your, at your county level that are very important. And of course, one of those being uh, the, the procurement man that would be working for uh, Dan's procurement department, your county meet committees, and your blockers, because they are the length between you, the producer, and the negotiators in the home office. And I know in my own case, as a negotiator, I cannot sell a product that I don't even know exists or that I don't know what it looks like. And uh, in my particular case, 
or our particular case in the feeder cattle department, it's probably, uh, when I say what it looks like, uh, it's probably more critical in that particular department than any other because there are so many different grades, weights. Uh, we have people that want 300 pound weight cattle and we have people that want 900 pound weight cattle. So uh, this communication thing is very, very important, uh, not only to me, but to you out there as a producer that we do have a good line of communication. Well, the easiest way to do that, I suppose, would be for each of you to call me every day on a daily basis. Well, the only problem with that is we've only got 30 lines that go into that, in and out of that office at Corning. And there's only, in our, my department, there's only about four or five people there to man those lines. And this organization is too big for that. So to get around it, we have to have uh, this county structure. Uh, we have to have blockers so that one man can take care uh, of each of you, or you can call in to him he can kind of get things lined up and listed down as to what is out there available. Then he can make one phone call and we can almost cover that as far as the telephone lines getting in there. I think we still probably need a few more, but and maybe we'll get around to it one of these days. One of the reasons that we have these uh, procurement people use this, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to change this a little bit. We have our procurement people call this inventory that they come up with to the home office. This does two things for us. Uh, it gives us uh, in the office a way to have a list that we can see that a staff man in the, and this is probably more so again as good a tool as I have to do something about getting your cattle bargained for, marketed, uh, negotiated to another individual or feedlot or whoever may be interested in the purchase of your cattle. I have a couple of examples uh, of what this uh, procurement program in conjunction with county people that really pitch in and try to make this, these programs work. I have a couple of examples of what they can do. Uh, I've picked out one at each end of the country, Rainsford, Montana, and way back over east, Cynthiana, Kentucky. In 1981, Cynthiana, Kentucky ran 311 head of feeder cattle. In 1982, that same collection point, ran 341 head of cattle. In January of 1983, we had procurement teams go into that area. Uh, immediately following, uh, I'm going to say a week or two following, these procurement teams coming out of those areas, or out of this area, there was just, uh, I, I noticed in the office a new life that came into that particular collection point, that particular county, and the people there. Uh, all of a sudden, I was getting phone calls from them. They were ready to do something. As of today, we've run 885 cattle out of that point. Well, it's, you know, I'm not going to say that's great, 
but it's sure a step in the right direction. And immediately, or a week or so anyway, following this convention, I do know that uh, uh, George Marsh, who is the blocker there, also happens to be one of your national directors. Uh, I do know that he has called me and is expecting to run 250, 300 cattle more, which would put him up over 1,000. And from in two years, from 311 head to over 1,000, uh, I would say that's acceptable at least. The other one I'd like to tell you about is Rainsford, Montana. In 1981, Rainsford ran 1,000 head of cattle or approximately 1,000 to 1,100, and I do not have an exact figure, but that will be mighty close. In 1982, they ran 1,439 cattle. After the procurement team went into this area in 1983, that point has run 2,714 cattle and they are working on a, another block of 1,000 that they hope to move in January, and I can't promise you that it would be 1,000, but I feel real comfortable in telling you it'll be over 500, which would put them up over the uh, 3,000 mark. That's a 300% increase. I mentioned uh, the blocker and the cooperation from Cynthiana, and I sure would not, uh, I wouldn't want to leave Dan Evans from Rainsford, Montana. I would not want to leave him and his county people out uh, after him doing such an impressive job. His line of communication with the negotiators uh, was excellent. Uh, there's many, many more instances like this. Uh, some of them not quite as impressive as this situation in Rainsford, Montana. Uh, but there's a lot of them in between the one in Cynthiana and the one in Rainsford, and we've got them strung all over uh, the country that have been successful. Now, I don't want to say that I have to be like Dan. Uh, we're not perfect in the feeder cattle department by any means. Uh, probably a long way from it. We've had situations where it does not work. You, you, there's no way you can hit 100% of the time, but I do feel like that uh, uh, we're way better than half, and that is a step in the right direction. In closing, I'd like to say that I believe these figures that I just quoted you and these examples that I've given you are a prime example of what our team concept can accomplish. And with your help and cooperation, I hope we can all look forward to an even more successful 1984. Thank you, John. The next guy I want to introduce to you has been a part of the slaughter cattle division for about a year and a half. He's got a background as an independent buyer and worked for firms around the country. He's been real instrumental in developing and progressing with the call cow block and in opening up a lot of new markets to packers that we do market with at this time through our bargaining programs. He is Steve Demery. Thanks, Dan. I'm a little shorter than most, so I gotta get that up there. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to the convention and to the meeting here. I'm here today on behalf of the Slaughter Cattle Division, and I wanna tell you how the procurement department helps work hand in hand with the Slaughter Cattle Department in making these programs function and putting these structures together out in the country. 
Let's take a look at what it takes to develop and make a successful slaughter program in a given area and what we need to do in achieving our goal that we've all sought to do, and that's collective bargaining, to receive a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Let's look at today. Let's look at the future and what we got to do to build those programs and make them grow and make them successful. Not what the programs were yesterday or what they were a year ago, but today and tomorrow. The first thing that we have to have is communication. Communication is the most vital link between the member and that home office, the National Farmers. Communication is giving that county coordinator, that collection point representative, that area staff, that representative, the information to give to the members out there on what the market trends are, the current market prices, and what programs will best fit your needs in a given area. The second thing that we need is an inventory. And a lot of people say, well, what good's an inventory? By having an inventory, the home office is able to determine the amount of production in that given area and what program will fit your needs in that particular area. That inventory will give the home office and the negotiators that volume to negotiate those contracts to those processors nationwide on a short-term or a long-term basis. The third thing that we need to be successful in making this program work is the volume. A lot of people say, well, we don't need the volume, we just have to do a good job of bargaining that 15 head of cattle that we got. The livestock industry is changing so rapidly that the small farmer, rancher, livestock producer out there today cannot compete against those businessmen, those large corporations. We've seen it in the large feedlots here in the West. Take, sit down and take a real look at how successful these feedlots are in the South and the West. They don't feed 40 head of cattle. They don't try to market 40 head. They bargain with volume. And that's why the large packers are so receptive to these large corporations and these large feedlots out here is because of the volume that they have to offer them, the quality that they have to offer them, and the consistency. That's why they receive that price that exceeds the daily market in the Midwest today. That volume is why we have the most successful cull cow block in this nation today because of the volume that we've got to offer to that particular packer and negotiate that price. We're the only one, the only organization today that has that cow block. And it'll work nationwide. The other thing that we need to make a program function and work is orderly marketing. Orderly marketing is the orderly distribution of livestock in an orderly manner. And a good example of orderly marketing is the state of Montana having a $29 cow market last week and the Midwest having a $36 to $37 cow market. Now you people are out there thinking, well, why they got a $28, $29 cow market and we got $36, $37 here? You go into the Midwest and you will find processors in almost every area within a 150 to 200 mile radius that we can negotiate or bargain with. We go to the state of Montana, that state has one single packer. They kill two days per week. They kill 400 a day. And how many cows are in the state of Montana? Those people cull their cows once a year, and that's in the fall. 
And I'll guarantee you, that Packer out there, he's as smart as the next person. He knows that they got to go with him then. We're able to avoid that glut and use orderly marketing with our cow block and in the Midwest because of the processors that we've got to negotiate with. The state of Montana, those cows have to be negotiated in a five to seven hundred, eight, nine hundred mile distance. And so in turn, we have that glut there. We have to use that orderly marketing to avoid that glut, to take that inventory out of that packer's hands or out of that auction barn. Week ahead bargaining and guaranteed price for the members' production is done by the things we've just talked about, the communication that's making the producers of where is what taking place in the markets. Volume, having the production to negotiate to the processors with to receive that premium, receive our goal in collective bargaining. Orderly marketing, the distribution of livestock. The members, that's you people out there, the livestock department, the procurement department, we can achieve that goal of our cost of production plus a reasonable profit through collective bargaining. If we take that step and we use these major points, what I've just talked about, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Four years ago, we brought a guy down, or I guess it was his own decision, to come out of South Dakota, where he had been experienced in working with the, con the county and the country level, also had been a manager of a collection point, and came to Corning and has worked up to the head negotiator for the hog division. He totally understands what this organization and collective bargaining is all about. And he's here today to represent the hog division, tie the two, the procurement division of national farmers as well as the hog division together. Larry Sills.